do 14 three and a half hour programs. We cover everything from the soil, the quality of the soil and how that affects your food, the cell, um, all the macronutrients, micronutrients, minerals, and then our water supply and the best sources and filtering techniques and what, what one takes out that the other doesn't. We're going to focus mostly on fat today. We've become a bit of a fat phobic society. Uh -huh. People avoid it like the plague and we need it for our cognitive function, for heart health, uh, for weight loss as Elizabeth mentioned, for energy source. Um, you make me nervous with the notes there, Trev. <laughs> don't, don't quote me. Um, so we're going we're gonna to try and, and unearth a little bit of the myth and explore the truths about fats and how important they are in our overall and optimal health. So fats are our friends. When I teach, Shalina can tell you, I teach heavily from my slides. I love my slides, so we're going we're gonna to use them a lot. This is just a, a little chart I made to show the classifications of fats. They're pretty much broken up into triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols, the dreaded cholesterol. And then under triglycerides, we have saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fats. Um, and then the breakdown of those is, is right under it, with the polyunsaturated being the really important ones for us, with linoleic, uh, which you'll find in safflower sunflower, gamma linolenic, arachidonic acid, which dictates something called our prostaglandin 2 pathway, which we'll get into in a little bit, alpha linolenic, which is omega 3, icosapentaenoic, which is EPA, and docosa hexanoic, which is DHA, and those come from cold water fish. Saturated fat is bad for us. That's a myth. Eggs, eggs are good. The yolks have the lecithin. All brain, all smarts. So saturated fats, we're going to find in our animal products. Eggs, meat, poultry, dairy, and lard contain mostly saturated fat and cholesterol. They're helpful structurally in our cell membrane. Every single cell in your body has a phospholipid membrane. And, and it helps dictate the permeability of what gets in and what gets out. What kind of nutrients can get into the cell and keep it healthy, and what kind of waste products can get out. They're not very susceptible to damage because they're inert. There's no electrical charge to them. So they're very stable, which means you can um, cook with them. Too much of these is going to thicken your blood, make your platelet sticky, and it is associated with cardiovascular disease because of that. Saturated fats in their chemical structure are straight, so they can stack up easily and they're sticky. So when they get in something like an artery, and if there's any damage, they're going to find that damaged part and stick to it. Coconut oil is a short chain fatty acid, but our body burns it as uh, fuel. So it's, it's actually a very good oil to use for cooking, and you can use it with higher heat. Whereas some of the other, like olive oil or the omega-6s or 3s, they damage very easily with heat, light, oxygen. But no, coconut oil is a good one to cook with. So this is a, a kind of a diagram of a cell membrane. And you can see these are the little phospholipids that I was talking about here. And what, these are the fatty acids, and this is the phosphate. So what kind of fats you eat are going to dictate what kind of fats are in your cell membrane, which is going to mean, is it fluid? Is it permeable? Can things get in and out? Or is it sticky and hard? And you can see these are glycolipids. These are used for, for conductivity and, and communication. And then there's little carrier proteins here and there. And those are how things get in and out of the cell. So this is your omega-9 fatty acid. Um, it's a non-essential acid, which means the body can make it. It's found in olive oil, almond, avocado, pecan, cashew. It's real easy to get. It keeps the arteries supple, and it lubricates our skin. Too much of omega-9, though, can interfere with the functions of essential fatty acids, 6 and 3. So extra virgin olive oil has been found to improve brain maturation, lower blood cholesterol, reduce production of cholesterol gallstones, and aid in liver detoxing. 
because of the vitamins and the antioxidants and the chlorophylls that are in it, it has these properties. And choosing extra virgin Mediterranean first cold pressed organic oil in a dark glass bottle is what you want to do to, to reduce the exposure to heat, light, oxygen. Olive oil, though, even if it says first cold pressed, there's a heat in expeller pressing that still happens. So if it's not bottled properly and kept away from light and oxygen, it will start to degrade, and you'll, you'll smell it. You'll know that it's gone rancid. The omega-6 family is essential, which means it must be obtained from our diet. Linoleic acid is found in safflower, sunflower, hemp, soy, walnut, pumpkin, sesame, and flax. Generally, people get a lot of this one. It's in almost any processed food you eat. The gamma linolenic is found in hemp, evening primrose, and borage oils. And, and gamma linolenic, GLA and, and DGLA, are derivatives of omega-6 in the prostaglandin pathway that we're going to talk about. And these work together with the omega-3s. And keeping them in a proper ratio is actually not only preferred, it's crucial to keep your 3s and 6s in the right, in the right um, ratio. If, six, if we tend to get a lot of 6, so generally, you could supplement with three only. Sixes are the, the essential acid that dictate the prostaglandin two pathway. It increases platelet stickiness. Um, it increases blood pressure. It does all the things that are really good in a fight or flight response or in an injury situation, but it causes inflammation. So if six is out of whack and always you're leading omega oil, you're going to keep yourself in an inflammatory chronic condition. And this is the omega-3s. These are another essential. So the only essential oils are 3s and 6s, omega-3 and omega-6. EPA and DHA are found in cold water fish. And the omega-3 is found in uh, flax. Flax is probably our best source for it. And, and once you have the omega-3 in your flax, you can convert to EPA, DHA. But what we find as nutritionists is we'll often come into contact with clients that can't convert. So often when you're with a client, you'll supplement with EPA, DHA for both heart health and brain function. And from those two essential fats, all the other ones you need can be made. Omega-3, this one works as nature's antifreeze, keeping your blood nice and thin and flowing freely so there isn't the stickiness and the clotting factor. It reduces inflammation because it dictates prostaglandin 3 pathway. And that pathway's only job is to stop 2 from coming to fruition. So prostaglandin 1 is an anti-inflammatory or the good prostaglandin. Prostaglandin pathway 2 is the one that is good in fight or flight or in an injury situation. Prostaglandin 3's only job is to block prostaglandin 2 from happening kind of the, the backup plan. So omega-3 also is maintaining the fluidity of those cell membranes, allowing nutrients in and wastes out. Prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are derivatives of the EFAs, and they're sort of like a hormone-like er, substance, and they happen in response to a message from the body. They're found everywhere. They were originally found in the prostate, which is why they were called prostaglandins, but they've since been proven to be found in all cells and tissues in the body. They regulate functions such as energy metabolism, muscle contraction, production of stomach acid, or not if you're in an inflammatory state, blood pressure, and immunity. And there are three separate families, prostaglandin series one, two, and three. So the PG-1 series lowers the stickiness of your platelets, so it keeps your blood flowing freely, and it doesn't allow for that buildup in the arteries. Lowers your inflammatory response, so it stops the kind of red, hot pain swelling that people get in joints and such. Lowers your blood pressure, improves nerve and immune function, helps remove excess water and sodium through the kidneys, and improves circulation makes insulin work more effectively. It regulates your calcium metabolism. Calcium, if it's out of control, can cause calcification of soft tissue. So if you add a 
a calcification to a prostaglandin 2 response, which is that inflammatory, more stickiness, more platelet aggregation, you can get yourself in trouble because now your arteries are harder and not able to stretch with your different changes in blood pressure and, and you're getting the stickiness. Prostaglandin series two. This is considered the bad prostaglandin, but they mean that from a chronic sense. It promotes aggregation of platelets. But if you had a cut, you would want that. That's your clotting factor. It causes so water and sodium retention, raises your blood pressure. It's getting ready for a fight or flight response. It's getting for you to, to bolt. Causes inflammation and has survival under fight or flight. But again, in a chronic state with aggregation of platelets, high blood pressure, inflammation, you're talking cardiovascular disease. PG3 series works in harmony with PG1 and prevents that PG2 response. This is just a little chart that shows omega-6, which is one of our essential fatty acids, and omega-3, and how they, how they break down to their different derivatives, and they end up here, PG-1, PG-2, or PG-3. And the dictating step for PG-2 is arachidonic acid, which is found in animal products. So, and, and then PG-3's only job is to block the formation of that arachidonic acid, so it cannot turn into PG3. So you have the good prostaglandin, the anti-inflammatory, anti-cramping, the bad, causing inflammation and cramping, and the good prostaglandin, an anti-inflammatory, anti-cramping. So your body's almost got its plan and its backup plan to keep you flowing freely, not in inflammation, not in pain, out of cardiovascular issues, but an excess of animal products in your diet can contribute to it. Deficiency symptoms. First, oh, this is, I should have put this up in one thing. When you see these, I'll just click them up. When you see them, think of someone you're concerned about or your own health and how many of these you could check, check. So deficiency symptoms for LA or omega-6. Eczema-like skin eruptions, loss of hair, Liver degeneration, oops, excess of water loss through the skin, because remember we learned that omega-6 keeps your skin supple. Without it, you're going to have excessive loss of water. So, sorry, this was for uh, omega-6 uh, Six. deficiency, but I thought we got a lot of that, you said. We do, but if you're in a, defect, in a deficient state, you're oh. still going to have this. So most people do. Most people are going to be <laughs> pro-omega-6, not so much 3. But if you get someone who's eating like really high saturated fat diet, you could still find them in this. Susceptibility to infections, miscarriage in females, clearly. Arthritis-like conditions, sterility in males, kidney degeneration, heart and circulatory problems. So you can see that the, as the deficiency would get more severe, so do your, your symptoms. Growth retardation, Behavioral disturbances, are you upset? I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Drying up of glands, failure of wound healing. Mm -hmm. And then this is omega-3's deficiency, and these you will see more often. Decreased learning ability. Think of our children now, and we slap them on Ritalin and put them in special classes, and we don't feed them. Yeah. Impairment of vision, lack of motor coordination, inflammation of tissues, Tingling in the arms and legs, low metabolic weight and therefore weight gain, stickiness of platelets, dry skin, mental deterioration, and this becomes noticeable, especially in our elderly. Their omega-3 levels can be severely deficient, um, especially if they're in a facility. Edema, weakness, growth retardation again behavioral changes, high triglycerides or fat levels, high blood pressure, and immune dysfunction. So the main functions of omega-6 and 3 are energy production in the body, oxygen transfer from the capillary, or the lungs to the capillaries and back, hemoglobin production, because the hemoglobin is what carries the oxygen to every cell in the body, 
membrane components. And we talked about the phospholipid membrane and how what fats you eat dictate the permeability or the selectivity of your cell and recovering from fatigue. <laughs> and remember that the prostaglandin formation as seen in the previous chart is going to be dictated by those fats. But not only by the fats. We also need cofactors like B3, B6, calcium, vitamin A, magnesium, and zinc. They're all necessary for the conversion of EFAs to prostaglandins. And because EFAs spoil easily, antioxidants like vitamin E and carotene are also necessary. These keep the EFAs intact in the body, protecting them from destruction by oxygen and free radicals. And it's interesting because something as simple as vitamin E is a potent, potent antioxidant. Mm -hmm. And they put it in our dog food, but they don't use it as an antioxidant in our food. They use synthetics in ours and they give the dog the good stuff. So our daily requirement, this comes from the textbook, uh, one of our textbooks, Elson Haas. This is one of the textbooks for um, nutrition and health, the fundamentals. It's a big puppy. It's about, it was written about 10 years ago and it's been updated a couple of times. He's um, it's a brilliant man and as an MD, he goes way out on a limb for us. So they say one tablespoon of linoleic, one to two teaspoons of linolenic. But that's an ideal ratio for someone who is not in a deficient state and you're just maintaining them. When there's, in a, when there's a deficiency symptom picture, up to five tablespoons of flax per day is needed to bring them back into balance. And that, that dosing can go on for two or three months. And then you'd reassess see what kind of symptoms people are experiencing and whether or not they need to stay at that level. I take two tablespoons of flax. Well, I don't do the oil. I do two heaping tablespoons of flax, and I grind it in a coffee grinder, yeah. and then throw it in a smoothie or whatever I'm having in the morning, just because it's fresher. And the minute you break that seed coat, it starts to degrade because omega-3 has so many double bonds, which makes it very reactive to light, oxygen, heat. So when they process the oil, it's still a refinement process. To get the oil out of that hard little seed, it's not a walk in the park. So there is heat. And then we don't know how it was shipped. We know that we get to our health food store and we buy it out of the fridge at the health food store. But how was it shipped? Was it shipped in a refrigerated container? And I've come up with more rancid flax oil then I would care to share with you. And it's disgusting if you don't think to smell it first and put it in your smoothie and then get it and then everything has to go out and you start again. So I, I've, I've switched now and I'm trying to do foods in their most whole form, their most unrefined, unchanged form. So I just take the seed, grind it, throw it in, and I'm good. And then I'll do that one day and the next day I'll do a fish oil. So I'm getting the EPA, DHA, in case for some reason I'm not converting the way I would like. And then I do the flax oil the other day. And you get the fiber with the flax, which is really high in soluble fiber, which is great for keeping cholesterol levels down. Phospholipids was another um, group of, of fats. And you think of it as detergent for the body. It naturally forms very, very thin membranes in our cells, and it's responsible for the, for the selectivity. It was the little kind of head with the two little fatty acid tails that went all the way around the cell. Part of the myelin sheath, it speeds up the conduction of electrical signals in the body. This is lecithin, or phosphatidylcholine, big deal in brain function. Mm -hmm. Lecithin is a source of essential fatty acids again. It's an edible detergent. It keeps cholesterol soluble so it doesn't deposit and it keeps it isolated from the arterial linings. It detoxifies the liver even after prolonged alcohol abuse. It's a component in our immune function and it's part of HDL and LDL, which are the two carriers or taxi cabs for cholesterol in the body. The LDL, which is the one that, that your mainstream medical doctor would find is a bad, bad thing, carries um, cholesterol from the liver, where it's manufactured, to the cells, where it will be used to produce different things. And then HDL picks up the excess and takes it back to the liver. So it's just like little taxis. They both run one way. And it's also a component of bile. And bile is made in the liver also, 
and then it drops into the gallbladder and goes through the bile duct and is secreted into the duodenum, which is the piece of the small intestine just under your stomach. And it's secreted there by a trigger that tells the body how much of it you need to digest the fat in the meal you just ate. And bile will emulsify it or break it up into little tiny parts so that your body can release lipase, which is an enzyme that digests fat, and it can, it can handle it because it has much more surface area. And then cephalins. My favorite cephalin is phosphatidylserine. I did this course in my early 50s. And one of the courses we had to take was um, pathology. And Trevor, you can probably vouch for me. You want to blow your own head off in pathology. <laughs> it's, a, it's so different than anything I had ever studied. I've always studied holistic modalities since my children were very young. And all of a sudden, we're in pathology, and we're learning like dead people in disease. And there's so many terms and so much information. And, and at one point, Edith, our instructor, who's doing the live cell right now, brilliant woman and so kind, and imparted the wisdom of phosphatidylserine for brain function. You should have seen us vault after class for the health food store. And it's a fairly expensive um, supplement, and we just didn't care. We were so on to the phosphatidylserine. It's similar to lecithin, except it has alcohols attached to it. It's one of the constituents of lipid coating nerves in the myelin sheath. So the myelin sheath covers the axons, kind of like little sausage rolls or little pillows, along the length of the nerve and helps for conductivity. And, and the, the synapse is firing quickly. And, and it's in the white matter of the brain. They've been successfully used in MS. Um, a student in one of my classes is an MS patient and uses it and has had amazing results and is on no meds at all. Um, a teacher that we had here, Mirat Vardar, he's been off for a little bit. That was his quote and he's, he's a brilliant teacher. He was my teacher for fundamentals and uh, I just wanted to quote him. We miss him. Sphingolipids are also made in the body. They're similar to lecithins or the cephalins, that phosphatidylserine or choline. These lipids are part of the myelin sheath, again, and the membrane. And then glycolipids are these little guys right here. And they're the ones that are, are used for communicate, communication, and they're in the brain and at nerve synapses. So you can see from this a lot of the complex lipids, like people go, ooh, fat, blah, don't want to eat it. You can see the kinds of things in your body that are, are begging yeah. for essential fats. So complex lipids are constantly being synthesized or made and broken down in the body. But sometimes genetic diseases are classified as lipid storage diseases. You might be missing the enzyme that is necessary to break them down and get rid of them. And then they build up and cause enlarged liver, fatty liver, spleen, mental retardation, blindness, and sometimes even death. Mm -hmm. So here are our sterols. The dreaded cholesterol contains, you can see it up beside the, the name, it contains three six-sided and a five-sided ring. And it's the most abundant and most important. And that's cholesterol. And I just, I like that. So cholesterol, this is a, just a page of material, and I'm sorry for it, but cholesterol is hugely important in our health. Cholesterol plays vital roles in many, many functions in the body. It keeps our membranes intact, so cholesterol molecules will go and insert themselves in the um, cell membrane, especially if you're in a state of dehydration. If you're dehydrated and your cell membrane is too permeable, the water in your cells is, is leaching out too easily. And you don't want that. That's toxic to your cells. So the cholesterol will insert itself and sort of stiffen up the membrane and, and make it a little more selective. It's a building material for steroid hormones, like adrenal, corticosteroid, and sex hormones. So cortisol is the um, adrenal hormone that helps you wake up. It should be being released in the morning as you wake up. In our society, there is so much chronic, ongoing stress that never stops. Mm -hmm. And we live our lives in an elevated cortisol state. 
until you go into something called cortisol exhaustion or adrenal exhaustion and your body just cannot keep up anymore. The sex hormones, estrogen, uh, progesterone for maintaining pregnancy, I mean, you, you can't swing a cat without hitting somebody who can't have a baby. And, uh, and testosterone. And then vitamin D. Vitamin D is synthesized, comes through the ultraviolet light into the skin, synthesized with cholesterol to produce vitamin D. Without cholesterol, you'll have no vitamin D. And vitamin D right now is like, you know, it's the, the kind of the catchphrase. And even the mainstream guys are now loving vitamin D. They've caught on to it. They see what a moneymaker it is. And now they're saying everything good about vitamin D. But our government is trying to delist yeah. our blood tests. So you can't go and have OHIP pay for you to check your vitamin D levels. But they know it's integral to your health. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're sick, you'll need therapeutic levels of like 10,000 milligrams a day, but you can only get it in one milligram. So it's interesting that when I was young, I could get four, five, eight thousand in a capsule easily. Now, it's, uh, now they know it's important, and we can only get a thousand, and they're not going to take your blood to figure it out. And if they had their way, it would be off the shelves. Really? Yeah, because then they'd want Big Pharma to buy it and be the only person who could distribute it. Because I can get Genestra vitamin D, 1,000 milligrams yeah. for three months for like $11. See what happens to that if Big Pharma gets hold of it. And it's also involved in making bile, which is necessary for the production of, uh, or for the emulsification of fats. It protects your skin from dehydration. By, by inserting itself, the, the cholesterol molecule, in your cell membrane. If you're low on vitamins or minerals, it can pinch hit as an antioxidant. And we've all heard about free radicals and how important antioxidants are in disarming a free radical because it's the free radical, it's sort of like playing pinball in your artery. You know when you play pinball, you pull it back and it's bing, 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 bing. Free radicals do that inside your artery. And every time they hit, they nick it, and they injure the artery. That's where atherosclerosis starts. That's where CBD gets its birth. <coughs> so cholesterol, being able to pinch hit as an antioxidant, is important to your health. It can't be metabolized as energy at all, and it's only excreted if there's enough fiber in the body. Students in, in um, this program will do a five-day diet on themselves, and they have to record every vitamin, mineral, fiber, gram, everything they ate. And what so many of us found out in school, it's, it's a project to get 36 grams of fiber in your diet with yeah. our food the way it is. If there's not enough fiber, it won't bind with the toxins and the bile and escort them out of the body. And if there's not enough fiber and the bile doesn't leave, the body will reabsorb 99% of it and send it right back to the liver. Oh. Now you're not making new bile. If you're not making new bile, you're not using that cholesterol. So your body is made to secrete the bile with the toxins in it emulsify the fats, be bound up with fiber, and escorted from the body. That's what we're supposed to do. But there's so little fiber in our diet, and, that's, and then it just goes right back to the liver, and then the cholesterol levels go up. Oh. Culprits that contribute to excessive cholesterol levels are clearly refined fat, total fat, chemical additives, and the awful trans fats. Trans fats are not even, they're like a food-like substance. The body doesn't recognize them, doesn't know what to do with them. They stack up, they're very sticky, and they're very contributory in cardiovascular issues. Vitamin, mineral, and antioxidant and EFA deficiencies are all going to contribute to the oxidizing of, of um, cholesterol in the body, and it's the LDL oxidized that is the danger to you and disruptions in normal biochemistry from our modern lifestyle. So this is an, a, a kind of a cross-section of an artery. 
The one on the left is healthy and smooth. And it's surprising how fast the blood is moving through these vessels. And on the right, you can see an atherosclerotic plaque formation in the vessel. What has to happen first, though, is the injury. If you prevent the injury, if you prevent the free radical damage in the veins, if you have lots of vitamin C and you're producing enough collagen and keeping the arteries strong, this isn't going to happen. This is the body's response. Cholesterol is like a, it's like a Band-Aid. It's like nature's little Band-Aid in there. So you're going to have cellular debris in there. You'll have calcium bits. You'll have, um, the cellular debris is from the nick. It's the damaged stuff. And then calcium will go over top of it all. And then to make it smooth and waxy, cholesterol goes over that. And that's just to protect you, because if the blood kept whizzing through there and you had a nick in the artery, it would tear it up. So it's actually God's way of protecting us. It's, it's preventing the injury in the first place. And then they sacrificed the animals and autopsied them and looked at the arteries. And sure enough, every rabbit had arterial damage and disease. All mainstream approaches to cardiovascular treatment have been based on this study in 1913. So we're almost 100 years, and they're still hanging on to this. But the problem with this, rabbits don't eat cholesterol. They're herbivores. They eat veggies. So you start slamming cholesterol into this poor little bunny his body doesn't know what to do with it. Of course his levels went up. Of course he died. That's what they're hinging the study on. But now there is so much money to be made and so much dogma attached to this. They don't want to hear anything different. So in the holistic mechan mechanism, LDL is not the problem. Free radicals are the problem because they are the thing that have the ability to damage your walls. Vitamin E levels in the blood are actually a better predictor of cardiovascular disease than LDL. LDL is 29% accurate. Now my teacher, when he was teaching me, said if, if, if early pregnancy tests were that accurate, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Nobody would take it. But yet LDL levels can be 29% accurate, and then they're going to pump you up with Crestor. The vitamin E levels are 70% accurate. Mm. They're a better predictor because they're one of the body's strongest antioxidants. They're the thing that will give the electron to the free radical. That's what the free radical is looking for. It has an imbalanced electron count and it's outside of its molecule. It's called the valence shell. It's looking for a molecule and it nicks you to get it. The vitamin E levels in your blood are what sacrifice their electron to help out and then vitamin C will refresh or regenerate vitamin E. Some natural cholesterol lowering choices. Some of them I wouldn't do, but they're there. Uh, vitamin B3 or niacin. High dose niacin, 500 milligrams three times a day, has been shown in studies to be very, very effective at lowering cholesterol. Uh, the flush-free version won't work on cholesterol. There is a kind of a slow dose, a slow release, called inositol hexaniacinate. You take it with meals so that it doesn't just burst into your system. Um, if using niacin for more than three months, you have to have your liver checked. You have to watch your, your liver numbers. But the thing with niacin is that the side effect is, is it's very superficial, but it's, it's memorable. It's called the niacin flush, and your, your skin will go red and mine was very, very itchy. And it lasts about 20 minutes. And you just think you're going to die. But it's completely superficial. It doesn't cause any trouble. It is, it is uncomfortable. So if I were going to use it on someone other than myself, I like to kind of practice on me just to see how it works out and then try it on another human. Um, I, would, I would now use the slow release. And, and take maybe a little less significant a change and then use other things at the same time. Pantothene mimics cholesterol-lowering drugs with no side effects. 
Um, you have to make sure you get the proper form, not pantothenic acid, which a lot of B5s are pantothenic acid. You want pantothene. And it's been shown to, in, in studies to be very, very successful. Vitamin C is a major protective agent against the damage to these arteries. It's more powerful for the heart than it is for colds or flus. So that's where its big claim to fame has always been. Oh, you've got a cold, you should take a lot more C. It's actually more powerful in protecting your, your vessels. It strengthens the arteries. It stimulates collagen production. It increases HDL, which is the good cholesterol that takes the excess back to the liver for processing which hopefully means it will be made into bile, pick up the toxins, take it out of the body, if you have enough fiber and water. Blood levels are not indicative of cellular vitamin C. Your doctor can take um, your blood vitamin C and say that according to RDE levels, you're fine. You've got enough C, but it's not the, the C that's in your blood that we're interested in. It's the C that's in that artery cell. How strong is that? It lowers the stickiness of ApoA. ApoA is a, a protein, apoprotein A. Um, it's actually more dangerous than LDL. It's, there's something called LPA, a lipoprotein A, which is another little taxi that takes the ApoA. It's very sticky, and it's sent to the artery when there's an injury. That's, and it's eerily similar. It looks very, very much like LDL in, um, in testing. So it's often mistaken for it, and it's much more indicative of a cardiovascular issue. And vitamin C increases vitamin E levels by regenerating or refreshing it. And it's been known to increase HDL, the good one, even in healthy individuals, it'll go up. Then garlic and onions. They contain sulfur compounds that have been shown in studies to result in lower levels of cholesterol. Some suppliers believe that allicin is the ingredient that's, that's active, and some believe it's allin. An allin with an enzyme and oxygen will convert to allicin. So the nature will keep the benefit of that until you cook it or cut it or free it from, you know, when you have an onion, it's like layer after layer after layer, and you can't smell a thing until you cut it. Same with garlic. But it... They're both helpful, it just depends on what team they're on. They'll, you'll hear one, one or the other is the big answer. Uh, there was studies done, my teacher told me, of a study that was done in India. They took three tribes that ate very similarly, lived in the same geographic area. They all ate whole grains and lentils and, and a little bit of dairy, and so they had some cholesterol in their diet also. But one group had lots of garlic and onion, like you know, a pound and a half of onions a week and maybe 10 cloves of garlic throughout the week. Another group had some. And one group, because of religious reasons or whatever, had none. And they found in that study that the more garlic and onion there was, the lower the cholesterol, respectively. And it's the sulfur that's in it that is helping you with that. So in Canada, we measure, like your, your dicey line, your kind of line in the sand is 5.2 millimoles per liter. In the States, it's 200 milligrams per deciliter, so it depends where we're getting blood tests from, how it will be measured. And this is from our book, um, this one. Dr. Jensen's Guide to Better Bowel Care. Really brilliant man, Bernard Jensen. Um, and in the book, he reports a doctor's wrath and polling. Polling was up for two Nobel, he didn't share them. He had two of his own Nobel Peace Prizes for humanitarian efforts in science. They suggest that thickening of the arteries and cardiovascular disease revolve primarily around lack of vitamin C. It's required for the synthesis of that glue that surrounds every cell. It's called a mucopolysaccharide, keeping our tissues cohesive or strong and together so we don't just kind of fall apart. Cool. Vitamin C is the strongest antioxidant normally present in our body. It recharges other antioxidants, especially vitamin E. 
and glutathione. Glutathione is thought to be the body's master antioxidants. It's a tripeptide and it's made, it's too big to get into the cell, so it goes in as three separate pieces and is produced in the cell on an as-needed basis. It protects many of our B vitamins from oxidative destruction. Our B vitamins are what is going to keep our mental state stable, our skin good, our energy up. Vitamin C is necessary for the production of proteins, collagen, and elastin, all keeping our arteries, bones, teeth, cartilage, mm -hmm. scar tissue, and other tissues strong. Lack of vitamin C results in weakened arteries and bleeding into <laughs> tissue spaces, or scurvy. Like we go through that now, um, you go to the dentist and if your gums bleed, he'll, you, need, you need to floss. Well, I mean, you, know, you don't see your raccoons in your backyard out there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they seem to make it through okay. It's, it's, it's a low-grade scurvy. If your gums are bleeding, your body is telling you that you're deficient, chronically deficient in vitamin C. Unlike other animals, humans can't make vitamin C from glucose. We have to get ours from our food. Um, animals can convert glucose through enzymatic actions to vitamin C. We can't because our brains require vitamin C. So from a survival standpoint, we won't ever convert. We have to get it from the diet. I guess they figure better bleeding gums than brain dead. Nature has developed a way for us to survive an early death due to scurvy by thickening our arteries using an adhesive repair protein called APOA, made in our liver. It's a carrier vehicle lipoprotein, and these substances are strong risk factors for CVD. LDL is eerily similar, which I just told you, and is often mistaken in blood tests and has been mistakenly blamed for the devastating effect. Rath and Pauling knew that nature allowed us to live for the survival of the species. To die from heart disease after we've reproduced is better than to die of scurvy before. Their article, Solution to the Puzzle of Human Cardiovascular Disease, was submitted to the prestigious Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and it was accepted for publication, and then shortly after they rejected it, likely because of major pressure from um, mainstream medicine. And then it was, it was then submitted to a really small little publication with only about 500 readers, and it was accepted there. Their findings go against all the established dogma all the money to be made by Big Pharma, all, all the protocols that the MDs are doing for CVD. This theory leads the way to cure the most prolific killer disease in North America with a few cents of vitamin C a day. It only takes about 1,000 milligrams a day to ward off, as long as you're not smoking. You have to be in the black, <laughs> 1,000 milligrams a day. Every time you smoke a cigarette, you lose a third of your daily intake. There's lots of things that are going to pull the vitamin C from your body, but if you can keep yourself in a surplus. So this is just a, a little diagram to show you about, I was telling you that vitamin C refreshes vitamin E. Refreshes, so here's the free radical, and vitamin E is gonna sacrifice itself to the free radical. So now it's damaged, it's toxic. But it goes around and vitamin C will recycle or refresh vitamin E so that it can be used again and it can go out and find another free radical. Vitamin C is then damaged, and glutathione is released and recycles or refreshes vitamin C, so it's now ready to help out again. And then anthocyanidin, anthocyanidins will refresh glutathione. So there's just, there's a whole cyclical thing going in the body where everybody's helping everybody else as long as you have the macro and micronutrients to do it. So trans fats. Trans fats bad. There's no other way to put it. There's no way you can be good. They, they are so commercial. They're so a non-food substance. The processing causes the oils to become rancid and often trace solvents that they used in the processing are left in there. They form an, uh, an often synthetic antioxidants are added. And the trans fats, I'll just draw you a little. If you're looking at any fatty chain, there's always it's a carbon chain. And then if it's a cis form, a healthy form of a essential fat, 
your hydrogens will be on the same side of the double bond. When you have a trans fat, they take very, very high heat and they push or inject hydrogen into it and saturate it. The first thing that will happen is the hydrogen will flip sides. Your body doesn't recognize this. It doesn't know what it is. And when it was like that, these repel each other. And the whole carbon chain will curl up and it can't stack. So when it's in your arteries, it's not sticky, it's not straight, and it can't stack. When it's like this, it's going to stack up. Sticky, stacking, in the arteries, cardiovascular disease. And the body doesn't know what to do with it. It's not, it's not bringing any sort of nutritional value to you at all. Many nutrients are lost in this process. Protein, fiber, minerals, phospholipids, including lecithin, for brain health. Chlorophyll, calcium, magnesium, iron, copper, beta carotene, and vitamin E. And in our deplete soil, we, we can't uh, afford to lose a single mineral. Hydrogenated oils. It's a process of turning a liquid, unsaturated oil into a more solid, spreadable substance with a shelf life of 10,000 years. <laughs> to achieve this, hydrogen gas is added to the liquid under extreme heat and pressure. And the saturation process changes that cis formation when the two hydrogens are on the same side to this, trans fat. And the only reason they did it was after World War II, they were finding that the natural oils were going rancid on the shelves. So people wanted a solid, spreadable, shelf life mm -hmm. product. And that's what we got. So you got to be careful what you wish for, huh? Unfortunately, this process produces a food-like substance not found in nature, and our bodies don't have the enzymes to deal with it. The trans fats upset normal metabolisms of your essential fatty acids and are implicated in cancer and atherosclerosis. So in summary, fats provide essential fatty acids that our bodies cannot make and which are important for our cells, membrane fluidity and integrity. They have an insulating capacity, maintaining body temperature and functioning as a shock absorber around all your internal organs. They provide the greatest source of energy output per gram of food. Stored fats are a good energy reserve, but the use of that energy is only possible if proper vitamins and minerals are, are present. And if they're not, and you're in a very processed food diet, and you're sitting on the couch, and you're not moving much, it will store as fat. They improve the palatability of food, promote digestion. They're responsible for carrying the vital fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, without our EFAs, all of those vitamins don't make it into the body. What I wanted to do, if I can, is go back to that <coughs> sheet uh, on <coughs> cholesterol. So when you look at that list of what cholesterol does, and now we know that LDL is not the bad guy. Free radicals are the bad guy. Well, so take some E in its natural state or as a, an antioxidant blend because they always work synergistically together. One will kind of promote the workings of the other. And you're not going to have this problem. People with cholesterol issues are now going to go to their doctor, and he's going to put them on Crestor. When you get home, Google Crestor and suicide and see what comes up. C-R-E-S-T-O-R. Just Crestor plus suicide. Or Crestor plus death. Because Doctors will not claim, and the package insert does not claim, that Crestor will extend your life or that it will stop cardiovascular disease. They're only saying it's going to lower your cholesterol levels. Well, now we know we need cholesterol for the membranes of our cells, for vitamin D, for bile, to protect us from dehydration. It can pinch hit as an antioxidant, which is going to stop the nicking of your artery in the first place. I'm looking at this, and it's also very involved in, in acetyl-CoA, which is the energy in the heart cell. So they're going to put you on Crestor, lower this. It's also necessary for your corticosteroid hormones, and we all know how stressful life is. 
it's necessary for testosterone, for estrogen, for progesterone. There's so many things we need cholesterol for. The issue isn't cholesterol's bad. The issue is to get to the cause. The cause is the free radicals. The cause is the refined food in our diet. If we ate whole, clean foods in their natural state, drank water, I swear I'm going to write a book someday, eat food, drink water, try it. <laughs> if we just stayed away, if you went in your grocery store and went down your veggie aisle, across your proteins, if they have organic protein, up the other end if you're eating dairy, get out before the boxes and cans and bags start calling your name. It, we would be so much healthier. Vitamin C, and this is a thing of the past. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you.